Yeah, that's uh, very inspiring to listen to the uh, experience from uh, Uruguay. And uh, uh, I want to start out with saying that I think cannabis and heroin are the two most important substances in the Norwegian context. Because uh, there are other substances used, for instance, amphetamines and uh, methamphetamines. So I think pretty much the political discourse centers around these Not two. Please, I, don't think. I think that very much of the book, perhaps this uh, works, does it? Yeah. <coughs> well, my argument is that uh, I think cannabis and heroin are the two most important substances in the Norwegian context, uh, at least with regard to uh, the political discourse in this area. So, I'm going to try to frame an argument uh, based on first some remarks about the history of Norwegian drug policy, which actually started out with a health kind of perspective, suddenly it turned over to a crime perspective, and after the year 2000, something like that, to a more open situation. And I think three uh, discourses could be uh, identified here one still centering on crime the other on illness, and the third, uh, and that's where the cannabis issue comes in, more uh, oriented towards subculture. I want to do, uh, end up with some comments on the current political situation. Uh, if we go back then to uh, the 19th, uh, early 1960s, we had about uh, between one and two thousand drug addicts in Norway. They were basically using morphine, amphetamines and barbiturates. Uh, and, of course, this situation was uh, very different from the present one, as uh, physicians, pharmacists, nurses, and also patients uh, made up the main body of these uh, uh, users. pharmacists and nurses and to some degree also patients who had uh, established this habit within the healthcare system were uh, uh, the, the main group. So uh, there were also some persons with a variety of substance problems, more similar to the present day uh, drug users. Uh, but uh, these people were of course basically situated uh, on a high level of the society. Uh, we all, almost exclusively with so illness metaphors used on them. None of them were punished. So this was a very, very different situation from the one that uh, was to come in the mid 1960s. Um, uh, this uh, writer, Tom Dickerson, David Shorter, writes very beautiful about this situation in her book uh, Gift, which uh, in English means both poison and married. Um, and uh, she was addicted uh, by uh, her. Uh, first uh, uh, husband was a physician. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very strong portrait of that kind of addiction that was, in fact, the most typical in uh, all of the uh, Nordic countries in the late 50s and the early 1960s. Then something changed, and uh, uh, but uh, before that, the first, uh, the first clinic for drug addicts was established in Norway in uh, 1961. Actually, that was the first in Europe. You had some in the United States, but uh, this was the first in Europe, and uh, it was called Starting Clinic in the Commande, Orbilant. It was just closed down uh, a year or two ago. Uh, and the key actor here was uh, Carl Evang, who was uh, uh, a health director in Norway for almost 40 years, from 1936. Uh, and uh, after he died, actually wrote the first parliamentary white paper on uh, drug policy in the early 1970s. So, it was the health discourse that totally dominated this area up till uh, the mid 1960s. But from 1965, a new regime came, and uh, that was centered on crime. Suddenly, uh, drug abuse, everything related to illegal drugs, was not uh, any, no longer uh, a sign of kind of illness uh, taken care of by the healthcare system. Uh, uh, another regime took uh, hold. 
And we got the 1964 uh, new law on pharmaceuticals. The upper hand limit uh, increased here from six months to two years for imprisonment. In 1968, we got the uh, paragraph 162, which still works in this area, uh, with a maximum increase in penalty to six years. Uh, as we all know, in 1971, President Nixon declares, war, so, uh, declares the war on drugs. And in 72, uh, the increase went to 10 years, 98, 15 years, and 94, 21 years of uh, prison. That means Norwegian maximum. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, an extreme development, and you don't see this kind of development in, in the other uh, area. Uh, so how could that happen? Um, I have myself some personal memories of this because um, uh, Carl Evans wrote the first parliamentary white paper here, but actually I was uh, engaged by the Ministry of Social Affairs at that time, just after I finished uh, uh, my education at the university, to write the second paper, so that's called Stupid Smelling Parliamentary White Paper 13. Uh, and I, uh, that was the uh, Norwegian Conservative government, and I wrote most of this. And um, uh, I remember that there was no debate about the level of punishment here at all. It just got, uh, I, I could, uh, I was quite free to formulate a lot of other things here, but uh, I just got this uh, chapter on uh, crime and uh, punishment from the Minister of Justice, and that should be uh, as it was without any discussion. And all these uh, increases uh, went with political uh, agreement. Uh, SV, the Norwegian left-wing party, sort of debated it a uh, little bit uh, in 1984, but Hamma uh, Kvamo, said that, uh, asked uh, how the, uh, the Christian Democratic Party in Norway would uh, uh, react to this, and the uh, group said that they would probably say yes. And then she said in Norwegian, uh, not in Norwegian, I can't say men mot mindre mot narkotika and I'm going to test it. So we have to go for that. It was not possible uh, in the Norwegian context to uh, oppose this, uh, this development, I think. Uh, so uh, what happened to the sentences here? Uh, in fact, they were reduced from uh, earlier. Also for minor infractions. Uh, let's take a typical case, 1971, three girls and a boy, school uh, students, in Masyaste, 18 years, uh, they uh, 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 prosecuted for use and possession of cannabis, and they got unconditional imprisonment, uh, 21 to 30 days, and a similar amount of uh, conditional imprisonment. So this was awarded from the Supreme Court. So even smoking and uh, uh, possession of cannabis uh, was uh, very hard, harshly punished in uh, these days. Uh, I couldn't resist taking a picture here of um, the most important Norwegian politician during the last uh, 20 years. He looked like that at the time. Um, and uh, he has admitted that he smoked cannabis uh, when he was uh, in his uh, teens, uh, which would have been a problem at that time. What if, uh, if he had been caught um, uh, and got an um, uh, unconditional prison uh, sentence? Could he then have become our prime minister for uh, this long period? It's difficult to say, but uh, I think it probably could have been quite difficult. Uh, at the same time, uh, something starts to happen in uh, the late 1970s, uh, as seen on this graph. Um, you see that uh, before 1980, all cases that were taken to the uh, court were given either conditional prison or unconditional prison. But then gradually you get the penalty notices for uh, <coughs> uh, So that increased the sentence. So today, uh, like 70% of uh, uh, drug uh, infractions will end up with a penalty notice. And uh, we see that um, uh, the proportion we get in an um, uh, unconditional prison uh, verdict would be like uh, something like a little bit more than 10 percent, which of course should imply that uh, few people would uh, come into prison in Norway uh, for that reason. And we heard that in Uruguay, one third approximately of the prison population had uh, an affiliation to drugs, and in fact, in fact, that is also the situation in Norway as well. And how can that be? So I did this test for my students in sociology. Uh, 
let's take three cases with a quite recent uh, uh, verdict from the Supreme Court and one from uh, uh, the, the, from another court. Uh, where we, uh, I asked them to, to uh, evaluate what a great manslaughter, uh, very serious uh, uh, murder in, uh, uh, was given in the Supreme Court, what uh, the rape of two women uh, with a torture included from, from one of them and a, a big cannabis smoking operation, uh, several hundred kilos. I asked my students in sociology how many years imprisonment would that imply? So I could take this test here first, perhaps. <laughs> what uh, would you say, uh, William, whom I happen to know? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 the, the intuition is that you feel that you should give more to, to manslaughter and, and rape. What would you think manslaughter would give you? Uh, bomb, the alcohol, the drop, you know, quite serious. Six murder. years? No, it's uh, much, much more. Oh, I don't know. Yes? Uh, 11. Well, it was uh, 13, they guessed 13, and it was 13. This was quite a serious case, though. <coughs> what were the rape of two women, uh, including torture? <coughs> ben Dicta could ask you. I have no idea. It should be uh, <laughs> at least 10. Yeah. They guessed 9, the result was 7. Uh, that was also from the Supreme Court. But then, uh, the fact is, what would the uh, 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 big cannabis operation imply? This was actually a guy from Morocco who stepped in for his brother. He was not, uh, had no previous verdict, uh, but he came and he was kind of key act, but it, he, he was not the key act in the Supreme Court judge. There was some, someone from the ministry here, what would you suggest? Vicky was the better man? Fifteen. Fifteen? They get six, it was 70. Uh, so this implies, of course, that uh, there are some quite strange things here. I was uh, giving this uh, uh, lecture for the Supreme Court, judges in the Supreme Court, and <coughs> they, they, uh, well, they, they understand that it, this could be problematic, not least if uh, uh, more states in the United States legalize and things like that. That before, uh, import of a commodity that's legal in the United States could get uh, 17 years in Oslo. It's, it's not that far from uh, the famous terrorist case we, which we had. Uh, some hundred kilos more that would be implied uh, at the, the same level as big uh, bread, uh, bread kilos. So it's, it's something strange here. And that's also the reason why uh, today one in three are incarcerated based on, based on paragraph 162, just as in Uruguay understood. Who are these people who are punished after paragraph 162? Kolle uh, Bødal, um, prime uh, director of a prison in Norway, uh, made his doctoral thesis about this in 1982, the 351st who were uh, convicted after this paragraph. And he found that uh, the they were characterized by massive psychosocial problems, substance use problems, and no, no signs of what you could call professionals or drug uh, kingpins or something like that, uh, among those who are situated in uh, the prison due to this uh, verdict. We just uh, published, uh, published uh, the paper in the uh, British uh, Journal of Criminology, uh, where we also interviewed quite, uh, I think it was 60 persons who were uh, in eight different Norwegian prisons. We were doing time on paragraph 162, and we have found basically the same pattern. There are no traces of drug kingpins in the Norwegian prisons due to this uh, kind of verdict. Generally, we should know that the Norwegian criminal system is quite mild. Um, it's part of what's usually called the Scandinavian exceptionalism. But uh, drug crimes are obviously an exception here, as argued, for instance, by Pratt uh, in a uh, recent uh, book. So, uh, are there any alternatives to this, uh, this uh, regime? Uh, well, there are some opponents here, but as you can see, they're quite old. <laughs> uh, one, one is dead. It's uh, Nils Kristi Jussan. In the middle, he was perhaps the key uh, professor of uh, uh, law in this area in Norway for several decades. And we have this Supreme Court lawyer, Ketilgen, who has uh, all of these have uh, opposed to this uh, regime, but I would say, moderate the success, actually. 
so look, we don't have any opposing votes uh, in the Norwegian system then. Well, I would say we do have. But uh, in the Norwegian political context, drug problems has to be framed as illness um, to uh, get some public, public uh, uh, support. And that's not very much uh, of a controversy related to that in Norway. If you frame this uh, with as illness, it's easy to frame this as also a part of a welfare state discourse. Of course, we have Tuval um, Stoltenberg, who is also a member of the Global Commission, and his daughter, who uh, had an opiate problem uh, and who recently died. They have been extremely important in this, uh, in this uh, area in Norway. We have also the, the Social Democratic Health Minister, um, Hansen, uh, who would very much like, he, he said, to be called uh, Heroin Hansen. Uh, uh, he was called uh, Brockwurst Hansen or something before that. And, uh, so he would like to be called Heroin Hansen, but I'm quite sure that he would not have or like very much to be called a Hush Hansen, because that connotates something very different in the Norwegian context. We have this uh, right-wing politician, Kali Hagen, and also the present uh, the health minister, uh, Ideas, uh, who also basically are, they, they're all in agreement on these uh, matters. If we could uh, regard uh, drug users as uh, uh, sick, as having uh, health problems, uh, things like that, they, are, uh, they should get uh, good treatment and uh, be taken care of in a proper way. Uh, so it's in a way it's agreement from uh, left to right on this issue in Norway, I would think. Uh, for instance, we have today a uh, possible situation with heroin substitution uh, in Bergen, in addition to the traditional uh, substitution uh, treatment by, uh, in Lai, by methadone supertest and things like that. I don't think there is a very strong political opposition towards this. Uh, that means that if, for instance, the present government would say yes, the Labour Party is about to say yes, I think, uh, you won't get a very strong political much problem with that. But what is then the situation with regard to cannabis? Uh, the question is, here we see some of the first cannabis uses in uh, Norway, uh, situated between the, uh, the King's Palace and the University of Oslo in uh, Schlotzbeckin, a picture from 1968 or something like that. Uh, and it's very difficult usually to, to frame these people as ill. Uh, I noticed also from the Uruguay that that, that, that was not the concept that uh, typically was used by uh, the former uh, in the former presentation here. So uh, we did this, uh, we've done a couple of studies on this uh, uh, Simon Sandberg and I, who's a professor of criminology, where we done interviews with people selling cannabis along uh, Arkishev by Moscow, uh, present in this book, Steve Capital. Uh, black cannabis used in the white Gulf state, and uh, also this book about cannabis uh, culture, where we've interviewed uh, 100 cannabis users. And uh, I would say that, to very limited degree, it's, it's possible to frame this within the uh, illness domain. Uh, I think theories of subculture and also of legality is uh, much more in, important and better suited to understand the cannabis situation in Norway. Uh, if we go to the United States. Uh, we see that legalization of cannabis actually was developed through a kind of medicalization process. Um, this uh, picture on the left side here is uh, from uh, uh, Los Angeles, from Venice Beach, where you have these uh, lots of uh, uh, medical marijuana doctors uh, uh, presenting their uh, 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 businesses uh, along this. Uh, this uh, Front line, yeah. And we have uh, quite close to that have we medical marijuana dispensaries. So you have this situation in the United States where you have like a little bit more than 20 states who, has, uh, uh, who have program, programs for medical marijuana. And uh, uh, I was living in Berkeley and uh, in Oakland, quite close to Berkeley, we have uh, this uh, marijuana university called Oakstedam, after Oakland and Amsterdam. This is an entire university built up around the medical marijuana. So I think the, the American situation is uh, characterized by the way, in a way by legalized 
uh, legalizing cannabis through medicalization. It started out with this uh, medicalization movement, and now, of course, uh, we, we have like, uh, I think the last poll said that it was 58% uh, in favor of, uh, rec uh, of legalizing um, cannabis as a recreational drug as well. But the movement was actually, uh, very interestingly, uh, through this uh, legalization, um, uh, which is, in fact, legalization, uh, 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 medical use uh, quite formally, because it's, I went into some of these uh, shops at Twins Beach and asked if I could get some around if I had some problems with sleep or felt some unrest and things like that. And, it's, and then, well, yes, the, the cannabis get that. Also, what the price would be, and they said, like, okay, it would be $100. And then when I said, okay, uh, if you think a little bit about that, and they said, $50, $30. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's, uh, well, I think that's, that's the situation in, uh, in California. And of course, if California comes after in 2016 with 40 million inhabitants, uh, and probably they will, I think then we have a completely different situation uh, worldwide here. So, do we find any traces of this medicalized cannabis use in Norway? Uh, we do to some degree, but to some quite little degree in older age groups. We have a very small minority who now gets uh, prescriptions on uh, Sativex, uh, which was uh, formally introduced in, uh, uh, around a year ago. Like 400 got prescriptions in uh, 2013. Uh, basically, patients uh, suffering from multiple sclerosis in uh, late stages of cancer. Uh, we have some illegal use uh, with medical justifications, and we um, uh, wrote a paper about that uh, a year ago. It's found somewhere around. And we have increasingly, uh, we are able to see that the ADHD is um, treated with cannabis in marginal populations, for instance, in the prisons. Uh, these prisons in the that we've done, we see that. Quite a few people uh, claim they have uh, ADHD. Uh, probably they not often got it from the, uh, always got it from a doctor or physician, but uh, in this way they sort of treat themselves uh, with cannabis. But uh, I would say that basically illness metaphors are very rarely used in the cannabis context as opposed to the situation with regard to opiates. So uh, if we take a look at the arguments in Washington and Colorado, uh, probably I'd say uh, California will come after in 2016 and probably before that Oregon and Alaska. Uh, I was discussing this with um, uh, the city attorney Pete Holmes in Seattle who, uh, who ran for, uh, for city attorney uh, as uh, uh, a pro organization program. And his argument goes like we should not prosecute ordinary youth. Uh, cannabis is not more dangerous than alcohol. Uh, the war is lost. We will continue to have cannabis, uh, whatever we do. And let's attack the matter as we did in the 1930s. Uh, and this program was quite uh, efficient uh, and got him this office in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Seattle. And uh, uh, as we know, uh, Washington State was one of the two that we last in uh, uh, last year. Uh, so, what about these arguments in the Norwegian context? So, uh, these are unpublished uh, results, so I prefer that you don't report them because they're not published yet. Cannabis is much more coined as a recreational drug, and um, that means that advocates of legalization in Norway often are situated either within these subcultures or arguing in a kind of neoliberal way. For instance, Midnight Button, Norwegian conservative newspaper uh, uh, journal, has uh, uh, had a debate about these things. Uh, and you, don't, you, you see that the left wing uh, uh, is uh, much more hesitant with taking this, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, on the neoliberal uh, position, you see that uh, the emphasis very often is on freedom. So I would say that within a short time span, legalization of heroin, as in, in, the of, uh, in the meaning of using that, for instance, as a, in a substitution program such as in Bergen, that's more likely than uh, legalization of cannabis, I'd say. Thank you.